There we go. It's me again. Annoying, isn't it? Or maybe it's just annoying for some people. And others find it just interesting and share interest, you know, show interest of things like body language, the ecosystem, other things I talked about. It's all very much appreciated, and I love this community. So, there we got plants again. These are red root floaters. And a bit of information about the red root floaters I have in front of me. A bit of data gathering on certain plants that need to go in the enclosure. Um, hopefully the scuds are okay. Didn't, didn't see that many just as, as I've just got home. There were some moving around, but they do hide really well. So I want them to have a level of breeding so they can be sustenance for other occupants when they go in. Um, so this plant, it's the, there's a number of variants. So this, this description should relatively fit uh, this variant and others, I hopefully. So this plant is uh, native to South and Central America. It can be found in other areas as well, variants of it. It's most common in the Amazon River Basin. So when this grows in channels and ponds uh, where water isn't so fast flowing uh, and stagnant waters in the aquascaping, fish keeping, Communities is very popular. Um, red root floaters are in very high demand because they they flourish in habitats that don't require a ton of experience. You know they don't. People are low tech environments. They they the nutrients will build up in the water, and they are very good at filtering that out and turning those nutrients into more of the plant. They can be quite prolific. Certain variants are very prolific, so you need to keep that under check. Yeah. Because you don't want them these floating plants to get so prolific that no light now gets down through the enclosure. Have you as you've seen, I have a day and night cycle here. So this this morning it comes on came on dull. And then the next hour, within that next hour, it gradually gets brighter and brighter. And the next hours after that, it eventually peaks and then goes down again. So quarter to 10 in the morning, half past 10 at night. So quarter to 10 in the morning, sunrise. 10.30 at the other end of the day, sunset. So, you know, the equivalent of because of light cycle. And um, plants do well with, better with a cycle. I believe they would do better with a cycle because this is what millions of years of natural selection has, has done to utilize the cycle of planet Earth and its spin, its day and night, and so on. People who say fish don't sleep, well, they might not sleep in your enclosure, and you might think that's okay, but I don't think that is okay. I think you're going to shorten the lifespan of the fish. When if the lights are always on, there's always strong light coming in. You get strong colours on your fish, but they're always displaying those colours. It takes energy output to display those colours with some fish. You'll notice at night. I've mentioned this before, and I've seen this happen myself. I've had fish tanks in the past where you got fluorescent tubing lighting in the hood in the hood of the aquarium and uh, for whatever reason curiosity or whatever middle of the night turn the lights on and the fish look pale and you think are they sick no they're just resting fish have rest periods just because they don't have eyelids does not mean they don't sleep. Everything has a rest and a activity and a rest. The sun rises, the sun sets, creatures come out at night. 
other creatures that come out of the day, nocturnal, non -noc not nocturnal. Um, everything has a cycle, a rest period, an activity, a feeding period, and digestion, and then activity and rest, and so on. So I'm going to be putting these plants in. Um, so they flourish in these habitats that we are building here. First and foremost, this plant provides some much needed shelter, as it says in front of me, and of course it does. But shade here and there, they've got strong, strong LED lighting. Some fish might feel a bit exposed for that. And you might occasionally get different behaviors. Even shrimp will prefer sometimes to go undercover or have some cover if they're feeling a bit shy, vulnerable, whatever the pattern of their cycle is. Um, whether you have shy fish, small creatures, vulnerable or larger tank mates, red root floaters can help provide some safety while thin. Uh, the, the roots are dense. Uh, yeah, the roots themselves are densely populated, but they're thin themselves. So they're not thick set roots, but they're densely populated off the plant. Um, and dangle into the water column. Small fish can swim into them for some cover and production pr protection. Even play playful fish will get a kick out of them if you plan on breeding fish or shrimp. Certainly, this is uh, ideal for bubble nest builders. That's um, the labyrinth breather breathers. Um, the Gourami, that's the word I was looking for, the Gourami family. Uh, you may have heard of them. Uh, sparkling Gourami, Dwarf Gourami, Honey Gourami. Um, all these different types. They build bubble nest. And one of the things that help find around that bubble nest would be floating plants. They're highly protective of it, but usually they don't tend to be protected once they start hatching and floating around and swimming around. Small fish can swim for cover. Playful, I've read that bit. Playful fish get a kick out, out of. Uh, if you plan on breeding fish or shrimp, a floating plant like this can also maximize survival rates. Certainly, tiny fry can hide in the root structure um between because again they're densely populated but very thin themselves so they get between those little gaps where an adult fish can't get quite get in there to eat that little tiny thing hiding in there there's also the matter of water improvement for this this plant grows and they pull nutrients through the roots like any other plant because the roots are submerged in directly into the water not into a substrate they directly impact the closed a closed habitat like this it's a closed habitat let me am i pointing the camera the right way i hope yeah if i show yeah that's a closed habitat meaning there's no stream coming from the outside and nate like it would in nature into the enclosure and away from it's all enclosed right of course you get the idea that this this is because fresh water from elsewhere that might be always better because it's gone through all these cycles and into a pond or a stream a trickling stream coming into a lake yeah it's come from elsewhere and there's water flow a closed habitat has to deal with the nutrient buildup and the ammonias and buildup from waste and all that within the enclosure. So you need things to feed on that to help keep it in check so it doesn't get too high because some new some of these nutrients, nitrates, ammonia, nit nitrite, um, and all these different things 
while they're food for things like plants, these tiny scuds and um, snails, they're toxic at higher levels to fish and other and shrimp and other creatures you might have in there. So this will help purify the water a little bit. So again, because the water, the roots are submerged into the water, they directly impact the water quality. Floating plants can help oxygenate the water while also removing toxins that could harm your fish. Appearance on the surface, the red root floaters uh, look like a delicate ground cover. It features petite heart-shaped leaves. Each one is rounded and sports a deep pocket to create a distinct shape. The leaves are waterphobic. That means that which is breaking the uh, surface tension of water on top is uh, you get probably it's fine micro hairs or whatever that pushes the water away from it and keeps the leaf itself dry while the roots are feeding on are wet and feeding on the water column. So they're water phobic, and where was I reading about that? These are. Do, 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 do. I lost my place. Yeah, water phobic. Any water that splashes on them will slide right off. Like the old saying, water off a duck's back. Or when it's really, when it's raining a lot, you will say, oh, rain again, it's all right for the ducks. Go look at a river when it's hammering down with rain. You won't see the ducks out. They don't like it either. <laughs> um, but the oils in the feathers, feathers are waterphobic. It's the things that are waterphobic stay dry. They repel the water. Right? So there's probably tiny hairs on the leaf that the water surface tension of a, a drop of water, the tension around that drop, or just not be broken by those tiny hairs, but it'll ride on it and bounce around and then just fall off like a ball bearing in a in some enclosure that you drop down. It, it, it doesn't drop directly through, it drops off. Uh, I don't know, I'm looking for a metaphor. I'm sure, I'm sure you get it anyway. It just, you know, it just disappears off. Um, and this aids photosynthesis. If the water stayed on, then if, if this is natural selection did this because if the water stayed on the leaves, sunlight will have a lensing effect on a drop of water and burn, channel that water and burn the leaves. This is also why you really shouldn't water your garden in midday in summer. Wait till evening or sunset and you won't burn the leaves of your plants and these leaves are useful for photosynthesis giving the plant its ability to do its thing, right? So is that. The plant gets its common name from a rich red colour of the root system. There's also occasionally the, a rim of red around the leaf itself. Individual root tendrils are tiny and delicate, however the roots grow in large clumps to create beautiful masses that fish can swim through. Size and growth rate. This is where I want to pay attention because I know certain variants of this are very prolific. You get seeds that build just at the center of the leaf where the roots are coming under underneath. And they sort of roll out and then they germinate and make little replicas. Um, let's have a look. Size and growth rate. The root, look, red root floater plants have a moderate to high growth rate. In good water conditions, they can spread very quickly. If you're not vigilant about keeping upkeep, you may end up with a thick carpet 
of leaves floating on the water surface. It catches many inexperienced aquarists. Aquarist. Um, am, I, am I saying that right? Aquarist. Uh, aquarium hobby. Aquarist. Yeah. Am I, I'm saying that right. Uh, been a weird long day. And aquarist by surprise. Luckily, controlling the growth of the plant isn't really tr tricky. Pruning. More on that later. The individual leaves of the red root floater start small, but they have the potential to grow to about an inch long. So they may be about so and so uh, circumference, an inch perhaps. It's somewhat circular or heart shaped. Red root floater care, whether you're New to aquascaping or your skilled hobbyist. Red root floater care is a breeze to manage. It's just one of the easier aquatic plants to grow and cultivate. That said, there are some basics to cover. Red root floater can adapt to most aquarium conditions, but if you want to give the best possible chance to thrive, give it the best possible chance to thrive, you could stick to the recommended below. And it gives you tank sellies and whatnot, which it should be fine, I'm sure. It's gonna be okay. Um, I'm gonna have a little bit about water parameters. It, it, I don't think there's gonna be a hard and fast rule for that. You've seen these large jars I have, but uh, it's not gonna be to doing too well in something like that, I wouldn't have thought, but in the actual vase enclosure, it should be fine and doing well. The blushing red plant is highly adaptable and does well in a wide range of conditions. That's, that's one of the many reasons why red root floater care is simple. As always, getting as close to a natural growing conditions as possible is best. That means focusing on tropical biotypes. The water should be warm and nutrient rich. I got the temperature right. I got fluval stratum in, which will give some nutrients. I got snails breaking down biofilms and they poop, which gives some nutrients as well. And all, all this going on should be okay for this plant. CO2 is not needed. Is a, I don't think it's ever really needed. It depends how you doing your thing as carbon carbon dioxide uh not needed like some other plants but red root floater can benefit from natural supplements like iron just to make sure that the fertilizers are safe for aquatic creatures you have in your tank yeah you, you just make yeah make sure whatever you put in you can get specific plant fertilizer or aquariums. Don't go and shove a, a typical garden center gardening fertilizer in there. You're asking for trouble and you're probably going to kill your occupants. So, water temperature is 70 Fahrenheit to 82 Fahrenheit. So, we're finding out what that is in Celsius because America doesn't know how to adopt what the rest of the world is doing because it's its own little stupid echo chamber right um in fahrenheit to celsius uh it should be i think i know what it is anyway but we'll find out 70 it's over it 70 to 82 wasn't it it should be around 21 or uh 70 should be around 30 32 Fahrenheit equals zero C. Oh yeah, hold on, seven C. I'm doing it a bit wrong. Seven, yeah, 70 Fahrenheit is 21 and to be spe very, very specific, 21.111. Ah, <laughs> uh, we have the temperature of being regular regulated about 21 centigrade anyway 
but uh, because that's kind of ideal for the other occupants I've got in mind to put in here and apparently ideal for these plants considering then how hardy these are it should be okay just literally to drop them in Cut. I got a bit of wind I've just eaten, eaten and I think I'd rushed it's been a rush rush day and I couldn't rush my food I was still in that mode anyway uh Do uh, plenty of it, so any of it that does kind of suffer a little bit will be compensated for any of it that does adapt to the water new the new water in. those growing what happened that ah, that's one a little bit there as well I think this variant actually has a tiny white delicate flower that can come out of the little leaves as well very pretty kind of love white petals with a like a furry yellow central center um yeah that's okay got that sorted so that's the red root floaters done so we have the japonica grass i don't know how to pronounce pronounce the first name of the chapel so we're calling it japonica, japonica grass for the sake of pronunciation then i'm gonna i know i'm gonna come across some struggle in pronounce some things that are related to this project definitely um so your ph around neutral to slightly acidic ideal with something i've been talking about that before um so zero to thirty a DHG. We're getting to the some of these measurements here and there. We we don't need to do like all these sciencey measurements necessarily. It's not crucial. You're not obligated to. Lighting red root floaters require plants require a normal day and night cycle. Already done. As I've said, it's quarter to ten in the morning. They'll dim light starts coming on and eventually brighter and brighter throughout the day by half past 10 at night the lights are off you know it gradually gets darker so they require a normal day night cycle to stay healthy about six to eight hours of light is bare minimum there's kind of ambient light that will come through as well but this time of year it certainly gets dark early i felt at the benefit of that people talk about the clock changes and i'm on the fence with that people say oh there is a pointless exercise a person that suffers in the winter when it gets darker and darker or suffers to get oh i know how to wake up and i can lull myself to sleep with the aim to wake up a particular time and i will wake up but it's still more and more of a struggle to actually get out of the bed. I can wake up that time and, and then and end up end up snoozing and going back to sleep. My alarm is my brain, but a secondary alarm would be a phone through the darker days of winter. I just find it very difficult to get motivated sometimes. 
spring and summer it starts kicking in and I'm running around like a nutter full of energy <laughs> it's just a contrast and it's a little bit the same for a lot of people um vitamin d would be a thing but that's a video for the other channel anyway which i haven't forgotten the other channel trust me on that um i know it's just ages since i've uploaded a video to the other channel it's about half and i veered off and come back to what i want to do with the health and you've probably seen me put on weight and then weight come off a number of times during the creation of that channel it's uh yeah <laughs> without getting into it that is what it is there so medium uh in lo a low to medium light in the leaves remain vibrant green you may notice some hints of red around the edges but standard light exposure makes the plant look like your average floater to make the red coloration come out increase the amount of light it gets high high lighting turns the leaves into a signature blushing red you have the greens and the closer it gets to the leaf edge you get that blush red it gets redder and redder to the until you get to the actual rim of the leaf is very red very pretty plant actually the substrate here's some good news red floaters don't require a substrate they just need the water they're floating in right as we mentioned already this is a floating plant the root system stays suspended in the water and doesn't make contact with the bottom at all now red fruit floaters can grow in mud and sand based substrates in some instances but in a typical aquarium setting this isn't something you have to worry about how to plant it or you just what I just did is sticking water and it floats and eventually it will, some of it seemed to be under the water surface tension but it had come up it did do it saying that you know just leave things alone and it, they do it their thing so planting the red root floater is easy as simply placing the young plant in your aquarium most pet stores sell them as small dime size root masses they may only have two or three leaves on them once the water conditions are right the plant will quickly grow and spread is there another one there's another one in there cool i've got more i was just beginning to think it wasn't much but that's ideal actually that's a good amount so once water conditions are right the plant will grow quickly and spread I think that's it, there's a lot more here trimming pruning yada yada it just takes some out and if you want to you could blend this and combine it and pack it down and dry it out and then and then feed that to shrimp you're recycling nutrients that way you're recycling you're not losing energy from your ecosystem is that's conservation of energy Putting the energy back into the system that was originally lost due to a action or reaction thank you for watching take care and i'll definitely look forward to doing the next video i'm excited about this project because i i can see a number of images in my head that thinking oh it's probably gonna look this way if i do this and that or that it's gonna really look like this other one with different ideas and I see I imagine the things that uh, shrimp swimming around in there yeah it, it, I'm excited to see this is going to be very therapeutic to watch this do its thing just like gardening you've seen me do pre prepping the garden during a nasty so side of covid I took a sony handycam outside and said this patch of gardens going to grow in these troubled times is going to grow some food I said we did grew food and initially there's a bit of initial cost to get everything set up of course but then nature does the rest 
this is outside of nature and you know it's an enclosed thing however you can still get nature to do quite a lot with this conservation of energy and cycle even though this is enclosed you do minimal work and nature hopefully fingers crossed is going to do a lot of work for us there's some th synthetic aspects to it of course you've got artificial heating artificial lighting you know it's not sunlight but it's equivalent pretty close because you got the rgb lighting red green blue leds and a pure white led they all work in sync you do that day night cycle um part of the lighting setup has a wire with a metal casing on that dips into the water and that tells that tells me on a digital display with this unit what temperature the water is so i know my heater is doing its job with maintaining this the temperature that i set the heater at and it's very minimal cost with the heater because you now the lid helps maintain and insulate some of the temperature as well and it also helps to slow down the evaporation of the water because you know, there's yeah there's holes in the lid but there's condensation that builds up on the lid and it starts dropping the water back down there are chances that it might get a bit cloudy the lid or whatever i can get that custom made as many times as i like and that a really really cheap cost however you do it you might do it differently you might not have a lid i want a lid for, for certain reasons that you'll see further down the line anyway so this is definitely an exciting it's fun i think i'm enjoying this it's, it's a fun thing to do and see the rewards of my efforts come back to me as i put the work in peace out take care i look forward to doing the next video on this cheers bye